Good afternoon. So nice to see you all. If it's possible and you feel comfortable, I'd like to see your faces, your smiling faces, your eager faces, your curious faces. It, it helps me connect with you. And I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart all the organizers of this event. And I feel honored and it's a pleasure for me to be with you this evening. And we will discuss something about sacred sciences. So astrology and yoga. So that's not very common combination that we hear often, although they are very intrinsically connected to each other. And astrology and yoga, they share the same roots. In fact, these three are sister sciences, um, yoga, astrology, and Ayurveda. So these three things are sister sciences that's meant for one purpose, to help human beings connect with the bigger whole, with the macrocosm, and help us to the journey towards self-realization. I would like to quote a particular song that actually very beautifully describes this connection, because the whole point of today will be about this connection. Connection between what? Connection between sky and earth. Connection between the universe and you. The individual is the microcosm. In fact, within our hand, the palm of our hand, our psychological insecurities, tendencies, talents, skills, it's all hidden right here. If you can just like bend your fingers, try everybody, try to bend your fingers, any, I mean, the back direction of like backward, like that. Like. And you can actually see how flexible your mind is. It's reflected in the palms of your hand. The more it goes backwards, you can see that the mind is more flexible. And those of you who practice yoga, those of you who try to, uh, let's say, control the flexibility of the body, you can actually find your mind becoming more flexible. And this is like a small, teeny example to show that connection, how everything around us is connected. And it's a reflection inside us. And um, this poem goes like this. This is a beautiful introduction to how um, all these three sister sciences can give us physical, mental, psychic, emotional, and spiritual directions. Because when we come into this material world, when we are born, we are ignorant about these connections. So these sciences were uh, supposed to help humans to basically, like yoga. Yoga is helping us, can help us to control this wind-like mind. Our minds can travel. I mean, right now I'm traveling to Durban, but that's only a shortest distance the mind can travel. And it can travel all over the world. And within a second. So yoga is, what is yoga? Let's define yoga. Yoga means union with the divine. And that union can happen only if we can control from beginning from breath, control our breath or become aware. I, I actually, I don't really like the word control so much because again, the mind doesn't like to be controlled, <laughs> but I would just say to be channeled, to be transformed, um, optimize the mind, making the mind the best friend. I like these terms, which kind of is more compatible with the function of the mind. So it's meant to bring that mental and physical balance. And also it helps us with this restless body like, I don't know, especially whenever I have to give a talk, the body gets restless. The, the, you know, the knees and legs are shaking and, and the hand is shaking. And 
body and the restless of the body is because of the restlessness of the mind and then ayurveda ayurvedic lifestyle it helps us harmonize the individual um, in a way that we can function in an optimum optimum level on the mental and the environmental level so there's two let's say the two sides of ayurvedic principle how it can help us one is the internal level it can help us to be in harmony and the second level is to keep the environment in a more harmonious way i mean the covid-19 is a perfect example of how animals are having a harmony <laughs> coming out into the human world feeling some fresh breath of air the the drones are showing how the pollution is way less than before and so many such incidents and even the just the basic exploitation of earth is reduced to a great degree so although there is so much pain and suffering we can see through this disease it is a warning sign it's a wake up call to humanity to make us take a look at our lifestyles to take a look at what were we busy doing <laughs> where were we running what's the purpose of that running where are we trying to reach so these vedic sciences help us to ask ourselves these question is it worth what i'm doing am i spending my lifetime in a worthwhile way and sometimes not sometimes often times it's very easy to can drift drift away with the world's passion and illusion and delusion that's actually what patanjali speaks about in the yoga sutras if you can avoid pain why take it up voluntarily he says in patanjali yoga sutras so that's the core of these sacred sciences and when we come to astrology it can help us astrology i always call it math actually when i have a institute called maths because astrology is like a map it tells us where we are and where we want to go and the cost the price that it takes to get to where we want so astrology is like a map that reveals our tendencies that's got us into the situation and naturally the mindset that we created the problem cannot solve the problem so the whole point of vedic astrology is to help us change that tendency transform that tendency okay that's point number 1 <clears throat> then point number 2 so the point point 1 is what the point 1 is how these astrology yoga and ayurveda they share the same roots and they help us connect with the universe and they also help uh, push us towards self realization whether sometimes in a pleasant way often times in a unpleasant way because like covid-19 is an example of unpleasant way of wake up calls then in the same poetry it explains asha klesha dosha vemba dhiyo lumulugi amana pashakolagagade nirdoshiyagu santoshiyagu what's the what is the common desire of human being we want to be santoshi means we want to be happy but we look for happiness in all the wrong places and it says the the when we place the desire in the wrong place i'm sorry when we place our desires in the wrong place exactly when we place the, the direction of the desires going in the wrong place instead of giving us happiness it ends up giving us pain so pain is not essentially a bad thing say i try to twist my arm in a very intense way and the bone could actually fracture if there was not pain so pain is actually a healthy function for human beings because pain makes us aware that we are alive pain makes us aware that there is a stretch just that we need to understand what's the purpose of that pain when we are doing yoga you know the mind goes through some uncomfortable feelings but if we know the purpose and we are stronger um they say um you are stronger than your pain you heard that 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 expression really helped me a lot helps me a lot in life whenever i'm going through some healthy necessary pain i tell myself you're stronger than your pain <laughs> hold on move on 
So if that pain is going to bring us flexibility, flexibility of mind, flexibility of thought, flexibility of spirit, then it's worth. But if that pain is making us miserable, it's making us depressed, then there's something to take a look with our diet, the way we are treating nature, the way we are treating ourselves. Maybe we are in unhealthy relationships. Maybe we are in a toxic relationship and that's not healthy for us. And so you don't need an astrologer to tell you you shouldn't be in this relationship. So sometimes we need to use the mind. Yeah, talking about using the mind, common sense. Um, as I've studied astrology since childhood in my house, my grandfather was an astrologer, my uncle was an astrologer. So they would always talk about astrology. And I've come to realize that astrology is basically common sense. And so is yoga. It's, be, again, it's being in harmony with nature. It's being in harmony with our body. It's being in harmony with our lessons in life. Okay. I want to quote this other thing from the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. It's 411. Karmic influences exist because of a mistaken sense of self and support of the objects of perception. In their absence, karmic influences disappear. See, in their absence, karmic influences disappear. So this shows that astrology works because there's free will. Nobody created your karma. Nobody, you know, it's not like some angels or divine beings were sitting in the sky and they said, oh, it's so boring. Let me just throw down some different problems upon different individuals and see how they react. <laughs> because many times when clients come to me, they seem to have that belief that what's happening to them is very unfair and it's not just, and they should be getting what they're desiring. But actually, if you take a look into their life, you actually see their patterns, you see their tendencies, you see that what they are desiring and they're not, they don't have it, it's actually for their best interest. Because if we had what we think we need, then we are going to make our lives more complicated, more miserable. So the planets, they are helping us to grow towards different, each planet, okay? There, there are nine planets in Vedic astrology. So each planet brings a lesson to all of us. This is a common thing. So sun, sun, I'm gonna speak about sun and moon relation in, in regards to yoga soon after this. So sun is that planet which helps us to connect with our sense of identity, the deeper sense of identity. It's not about what you're doing, it's about who are you. That's core about sun. The moon, it gives us that emotional clarity, mental strength, emotional stability to represent that identity that we have within the world outside. Then comes the most uh, jovial, friendly planet, Mercury. So Mercury is that planet who wants to communicate everything. <laughs> everything it knows, everything it doesn't know, everything it wants to know, it wants to communicate whatever is the process going on for us. Then after Mercury is communicating, Venus, Venus is the planet which forms desires. Venus says, I want this, I like this, I like her, I like him, I want this, I want that. So Mer Venus is that planet. So when we have our Venus well situated, we know how to make good choices, essentially. So when our Venus is a little disturbed, we make the wrong choices and then it takes us a very hard, long route to learn our lessons. This is not the type of a boy for you. This is not the type of the girl for you. So the universe has its way to show us uh, the right direction, the right person for us and the right, more than the right person. Please, my dear friends, remember, it's, it's not about finding the right person. It's about being the right person. Because if we are in the right consciousness, then we attract the right individuals into our lives. That's, that's the Venus aspect. So if we are happy with ourselves, then we wait. I mean, actually, it's not such a great idea to wait for the other person to complete us. Because one person... <laughs> so... It's better to 
feel complete first, then we will make better decisions. After Venus is Mars, Mars acts on that desire. Mars is like, I want this and I'm going to fight for it. So if we have a good placement of Mars, we pick the right fights. If you've got a problem in picking the wrong fights, there's something to do with Mars energy. <laughs> and Narshingadev is the Lord of Mars. And anyway, we, this is like a detail. Um, you can later on, I will share my website where I've written some uh, articles and books about it. You can study more about the planets. So Mars says, I want this and I'm going to get it and I'm going to fight for this. Then comes Jupiter and Jupiter is the planet of justice. Jupiter is the planet of Dharma. So Jupiter makes us realize that we have to follow rules if we want something. So Jupiter says, this is the good you need to do and then you can reap the good. So Jupiter sets all the clear boundaries. Then comes my favorite planet, Saturn. Saturn comes and says, wait a minute guys, what are you deciding? What are you fighting for? What are you trying to draw boundaries about? Game over. You know, it's like the mom who comes to the playground and tells the kids, game over, castle destroyed, come home, do your homework. That's Saturn. <laughs> so Saturn is that planet of reality. I wrote a book called, Are You Ready for Saturn? Because I had so many clients who were afraid of Saturn. So I wrote this novel. This is my first novel. It's like in a story format. Mm. It's about a girl who's gonna enter her Saturn period and she's freaking out, she's so scared and she meets an astrologer who tells her the real, the greatness of Saturn. You know that Saturn is actually called the planet of greatness? We only need to have a little bit of greatness to recognize him. <laughs> because if we become afraid of pain, because Saturn is the planet of pain, if we become afraid of pain and imagine we say, I don't want to experience pain, you know, just this morning I was cooking in the kitchen and I had a little burn. Imagine I didn't feel pain. That burn could have destroyed my whole body because of the fact that it hurts me a bit. I take my hands off and I don't do it anymore. So the same thing in our life. When we mess up, Saturn is there to save us. It helps us to not get entangled even more. Trying to do a yoga posture that we get completely entangled that we cannot un untangle it ourselves is not so nice. So Saturn is that planet of reality. Okay, so these are the seven planets which have these different roles of um, identity, emotions, communication, desire. So we are in this wave, waves of planetary influences. See, traditionally the yogis, they were so in touch with themselves. They were so self-realized and therefore they, could, they would be doing meditation all day then once in a while they open their eyes and they look up in the sky and because of the knowledge and that sense control and that self-realization they had, they would look up in the sky and they would actually see how those planetary alignments were reflecting on our minds, on our lives. Most of the things that we, we feel difficult is only a reaction of the mind. It's not actually what's happening. In fact, you put three people in the same exact situation. One person uh, reacts with happiness, another with joy, another with fear. Same exact situation. Like say a rain, you push somebody out in rain. By the way, it's raining here in Mayapur. So when it's raining, this morning I was telling my husband, I want to get drenched in the rain. <laughs> so that's like the, the mind's mood, right? Somebody else may say, oh my God, it's raining and become very scared and run away. I've done that too. So we also don't have the same, right? We're not always happy about the rain. We also have happiness, depression, anger, fear, all this. So the point of these sacred sciences is to become aware of these emotions and to harmonize with them, not suppress them. Nowhere in the Yoga Sutra, nowhere in Vedic Astrology, nowhere in the Shastras like Bhagavad Gita, it is recommended to suppress. Everywhere it's recommended to process it, to deal with it, to take a look at it. That's the point of yoga. That's the point of taking a look at our mind. That's the point of introspection. So how can we change? Like we can change our mind and our body by doing yoga practices, by 
meditation, by changing our tendencies, by patterns. And one key word is responsibility. Responsibility is also a Saturn thing. So responsibility can be accepted for what we are, our tendencies. Then those karmic habits can be erased. So Vedic astrology, yoga recommends these two things. Taking responsibility for our decisions, for our action, for our growth. And then meditation, introspection. Okay, let's see. What's the next point I wanted to share? Yeah. Prana, udana, apana, samana, ananda bharati ramana. Ananda Bharati Ramana Nine Sharvadi Tirvanartya Haranige Yanadana Pali Pavarenya Yanadana Pali Pavarenya Nanu Niruta Daliene Nesagi de Mana Sadi Karmanina Gopisi Denu Prananata Siri Vijaya Vitalana Prananata Siri Vijaya Vitalana Prananata Siri Vijaya Vitalana Kani Sikodu Dubhanu Prakasha. So, this is an exercise I want to do with all of you. Mm. Prana. How many of you are familiar with the word prana? Prana. How many of you are familiar with Hatha Yoga? Very good. Okay, so we have Hatha Yogis here. So let's, let's describe the term Hatha Yoga. So Hatha, this has two words, right? Ha and Tha. So Ha is when, the, when, when there is a raising of the breath and it comes deep from the heart. So when you take breath in, you can all take that breath and you can actually feel, feel that warmth, that is warmth because the body is, um, the, from the, the air from the body is rising. So this, symbol, this is a symbol denoted by Ha. And this is actually connected to Sun, planet Sun and the Ha because it's warmth and it's connected with sun. And then tha. Tha is actually the breath. Actually, breath taken is apana. Hatha. Prana is the ha, which is the sun. And the breath taken is apana, which is the moon. So the breath taken is moon. And this two the variation of the intake and out, out, how do you call it? Intake and out breath, is it called like breathing out? Yeah, so these two, when they synchronize, there are so many esoteric meanings about this, but essentially it is, this is the way that we can balance the masculine and the feminine energies, you can say, because sun represents masculine and moon represents feminine. And there is also, in the yoga system, it is described how many times we focus more on the, when we breathe in, we usually say, hold the breath, how long can you hold it? And we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we try to do it in a very kind of a passionate manner. And then we, you know, we competition, you know, how long is the other person <laughs> keeping the breath? So actually it is said that it's, it's so powerful. When we breathe in, when we hold that breath, that, that position, when we are holding that breath, it seems is the closest that the soul, the living entity can get to the divine. Because it is said that the divine is called Paramatma in Vedic texts. So Paramatma is situated in our heart, in everyone's heart. But we are, it's like he's the closest to us. But if our consciousness is, off, <laughs> he is the most distant from everyone, anyone. So when we are not connected with Paramatma, means the Lord in our heart, we try to look for intimacy with people outside. 
We constantly look for partners to make us feel uh, intimate, to make us feel comfortable, to make us feel that coziness because we are not connected. So whenever we take in that breath and hold it, that is the most powerful moment that we are so close in touch with the Lord. And so we can actually derive that energy, that inspiration. And then when we breathe out, we're bringing that connection to the rest of our body, to the rest of our existence and into our aura. There is a aura that is, and the aura before it gets into the external aura, it gets into our chakras. So that's what is, you know, in simple terms, you can say a kind of enlightenment. Most people don't really want enlightenment. Most people just want to get by. <laughs> So if you want to just get by, then what yoga means, what astrology means is a completely different thing. Or you go to an astrologer, you show their hand, you they see your chart, this is going to happen. You're going to meet this person at this time. You're going to get married. You're going to have two kids. You're going to work in this job. That's like get by type of um, help that we can get from sacred sciences. But if you want enlightenment, you want the best, right? <laughs> we want the best, then it, it has... Uh, there's so much more beauty, even in pain, especially in pain. Yeah. Okay, so I want to summarize this quickly, and then we can take some questions and do some interactive stuff. The core of the yogas, there are different kinds of yogas. There is... Um, the core of all these yogas is bhakti yoga because bhakti yoga is that divine connection with the Lord and that devotion, that um, reestablishment of that connection with the Lord is actually the heart of all the yoga system. <clears throat> From there comes everything else. So everything else is only like a, you can say it's a byproduct of bhakti yoga. However, by engaging our mind in the right way, by engaging our senses in the right way, we can help that bhakti, that seed of devotion, which is inside our heart, inside our breath. You know, there's a, there is a deity, there is a deity, how you say, divine entity who rules over the breath. There are thousands and thousands of deities, divine beings who rule different parts of our body. Ashwini Devatas, they actually rule um, our hands. And there are uh, so many deities, okay? So many divine beings who actually are in control. So there is a particular Mukhya Prana. He's actually like, you can say Hanuman, like the energy of Hanuman. So every breath we are taking and every breath we are releasing, that particular divine being is active within us. And he's always trying to help us to reorient our mind, our heart, and our consciousness in the right direction. So it's, it's up to us how much we want to receive that divine energy. Oh yeah, this, th there is this, um, yeah, I, I wanted to mention about the control aspect. See, we cannot control the sun, moon, and we cannot change our chart. And I, you know, many people tell me, Oh, I wish I had my moon just one house away. <laughs> just the next house, you know, I would be happier in life. It doesn't work like that. You see, it doesn't work like that. It's exactly where it needs to be for our growth, for our development. Because it's like going to a doctor, you know, you just say, oh, I just wish that, you know, when the test was going on, I just wish my heartbeat was, a little, you know, two, three inches better than the doctor wouldn't have given me this medicine. But you needed that medicine. <laughs> Who are you trying to prove that you don't need the remedy, right? Okay, so the conclusion. There is that connection aspect we can see in everything in our life with our body. We can sanctify our body. Like for example, in Bhakti Yoga, we recommend marking our body with like divine clay that actually on different chakras of our body, which activates those chakras, which purifies those chakras. So we are giving that Bhakti message, telling our chakras, please only receive good energy. Like you can see me, I have it here also. So I'm telling this particular um, chakra of my body, Please, it's a, it's a psychological message. Please, please only take in good thoughts, only good messages. And please create a shield so that I do not receive 
negative energy. So similarly for every chakra, and let me only allow good relationships, good vibes, and let me keep distance from negative relationships and so on. Then we can also sanctify our food. We can actually become vegans or vegetarians and become conscious of the environment. And we can also offer that food. Again, with our mind, we can actually ask forgiveness for all the bugs and entities and all the creatures that were harmed in the process. Because even just plucking a salad leaf, it may look very harmless, but there is a lot of um, bugs that have been damaged. And, and the, you know, there is so much, if we want to go in that direction, there is so much information in terms of how other entities are harmed in the process of us getting food and what to speak of eating animals. It has very severe consequences. And then for the mind, we chant, we chant the holy names because if you just tell the mind, don't think of anything, especially don't think of negative things. It's like saying, don't think of a white elephant. Don't think of a white elephant. What does the mind think? All the problems that we have, right? The white elephant. So instead we put the mind in the right direction and we think of the divine. We take the shelter of the holy name. The holy names is maybe we have some Kirtan seminars. I saw we have some nice topics about what's the effect of this holy name um, that again brings us into that connection, especially the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. We, just, we recommend that highly because this is Hare and Krishna. This is sun and moon energies, which actually combine together to give us that activation of that balance of spiritual energies and we remain with good association like all of you here today so i'm i'm open to hear comments from you questions any uh, realizations you have so let's open the form for some interaction let's do it by voice i guess it's better yeah can we do it Solana? Sorry, I was muted. Um, okay, yes, now everyone, if, um, since um, Sri Radha Govinda Mataji has asked for us to ask questions personally, would you like to ask your questions? Turn your video on and your, and your uh, microphone. Uh, Kush Singh, we have a question from you first. Would you like to ask? Uh, okay. Hi Krishna. Um, hi Krishna Mataji. Hi Bo. Um, Krishna. <laughs> yes. Um, am I? Well, actually, I had two questions. The first question was, I was. Um, is there a difference? Me too. I'm surprised. I thought there should be more. <laughs> I, I want to give other people chances as well. Okay. Um, the first question: Is there a difference between the flexibility in our right hand and our left hand? Oh. Is there any significance in that difference? Yes, so left hand is basically like tendency hand. So that's like we are kind of born with it or issues that we have to resolve. And right can reflect how it is right now, like present, currently. Okay, all right. And then- um, Also the second on which is your, what, what's your uh, predominating hand? That's another concentration. Okay. Your right. left then, hand, then your left hand is uh, your present. Um, okay, and then well, the other question that I was uh, I was wondering is how you know you mentioned how we can our mind can be our friend or our enemy, and so instead of talking about um, trying to control the mind, we should try to make our mind our friend. How can we focus more and try and develop the mind as a friend? Hmm, very good question. On Sunday, I have another uh, topic on how to connect with your hidden talents, how to discover your hidden talents. I'll be talking a little bit more about this there. But one thing I want to say is everything starts with self-awareness, self-acceptance. And one of the biggest enemy is when we try to fight the friends, so to say, you know, like there are certain, like Saturn, okay, let's say Saturn. Saturn basically represents all the difficulties we have in our life. Um, that guy or a girl that broke up with us, that relationship that we wanted so badly but did not work, that particular college that we wanted to go but we got rejected, 
And um, I mean, I, I guess you know better the details of your own life in terms of, you know, planetary, I mean, in terms of your timing, when you wanted something and you didn't get and you got it. So basically Saturn represents all those disappointments. And interestingly, you know, there's the cycle every two and a half years Saturn moves. So whenever we don't get something in the particular time, we don't immediately realize. But way many, many years later, we look back and say, thank God I didn't get that thing that I wanted so badly. You know, thank God, you know, that relationship would have been terrible for me. That college would have been the worst <laughs> for me and so on. So we realize only many years later that what, did, what we did not get was for the best interest. And as an astrologer, like, I, it's so hard to convince people about this because I'm seeing the person really like freaking out and being so depressed. And I'm like, oh, years down the line, you're going to be so grateful for this. I don't know how to convince you about it because you can see through the influences. Whereas when Saturn gives us something, sometimes it gives us certain friendships, certain college that we maybe in the beginning didn't like it so much. But at the moment of deathbed situation, we look back and say, wow, I got that particular thing. I didn't like it so much in the beginning, but it saved me. So those are all the gifts that we get. So my one sentence answer is accept life as it comes. My grandfather used to always say this, accept life as it comes. Don't run after things. Don't get desperate. Things will come when it's the right time. Don't become depressed when things are taken away from you because it's the best thing that could happen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that, those questions. Um, the next question is from Mark Naidu. Would you like to ask in person? Yeah, actually, we're kind of giving importance to those who speak because I didn't even look at any other questions. Ryan Park, where is she? Mark, are you here? Um. Okay, maybe we should just go to the next question. Um, the next question is from Bronwyn Lane. Uh, would you like to ask in person, Bronwyn? Yeah, sure. Um, so my question would be, so earlier you spoke about becoming aware of emotions and processing emotions. So do you have any tips on processing your negative emotions, especially those that kind of overtake you in the heat of the moment and are sometimes difficult to control? You want a one word answer? <laughs> if it's that simple. Okay. <laughs> Journaling. See, most of the times we don't know what we're feeling. When we are having, when you said negative emotions, the image that comes to my mind is like an autumn bomb. You know, this bomb, which is like, it's like, that's how it looks. It's like all entangled. You see, you can't see what's going on. If you consider each of my finger, like a particular wire, it's all like entangled like this. So we call that negative emotion. But when you actually take those wires and just one, by one, by one. That's how you diffuse an autumn bomb, by the way. <laughs> so you do it one by one. You don't deal with it as the whole thing. Because when we try to deal with it as a whole thing, it appears insurmountable. And there's no insurmountable problem that the planets or the universe or the divine sends our way if we're not capable of handling. It's just that you know what really helps another one word answer? Pranayama. Actually, I'd like to, before we go away, you know, in the end, after the questions, I want that all of us do this uh, balancing of the sun and the moon, the two sides of the brain, the rational and the emotional. So we can actually balance these two sides by breathing. Pranayama personally has helped me a lot to ground myself 
and to see things as they are and not as my mind wants to paint the picture of I am a victim and uh, or you know you can you can have different sorts of um, we call it psychological insecurities so when we have these different psychological insecurities we think I'm not good enough that's a big one it's a huge one that's our biggest psychological insecurity and therefore we think oh, the, all these negative things and then another thing is we feel oh I'm a victim you know people did this to me nobody did this to us we did it to ourselves see the responsibility aspect so journaling breathing and accepting journaling breathing accepting three ings I should write it down because I need to that's my journal <laughs> <laughs> You for that question thank you for your response did it help you did you yes it that? did it did definitely and and if you if you like you you can contact me personally i can give you some tips on how to journal or how to know that you haven't practiced it i can give you more you can write me okay that, that would be really nice thank you okay, okay. Our next question, actually, it's from Ryan Mark Naidu. So are you here, Ryan Mark Naidu? Would you like to ask your question? Oh. He prefers to be very quiet. I guess that's one of the remedies he's following. Maybe some astrologer uh, told him not to speak much. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> let, let me just ask a question. Um, he's asked, um, how can one's planets in the birth charts be empowered? Does chanting the Maha Mantra empower these planets? Do gemstones work? I mean, there are many ways. Mm, one of the things to empower the planets. One of the most powerful in Vedic astrology is behavior modification is one of the most practical means of pacifying karmic planetary energy and activating the positive planets or empowering the planets. Then another one is, I mean, this is, this is like super basic Vedic principles. The Yamas include nonviolence, truth, not stealing, conservation of vital forces and non-possessiveness. That's another way to also empower those planets who, who rule those qualities. And the Yamas are the external practices which are to be incorporated during daily life waking up early meditation yoga all these things again like open up your see all these planets each planet is is connected to our chakras there are different chakras that are in our body so when we take care of our body like a temple then we are activating that particular energy and then the niyamas are the internal practices that is used to change our consciousness so i am personally not uh, the great fan of gemstone remedies because uh, I believe uh, that uh, a stone cannot change lifetimes of tendencies and <laughs> negative uh, thinking that we have created. It cannot just, you know, destroy all of it. It's the change of consciousness that's the most powerful. So mantras, again, can mantra means to bring that mind into that let's say, in a space and create friendship with the mind. And um, what was the other aspect of the question? Does Maha Mantra, yes, Maha Mantra definitely, well, when, I, when, you, when you say Maha Mantra, it's meant for a great, Maha means the greatest. So the Maha Mantra is meant for the greatest purpose and that is to invoke bhakti in our heart. It's to empower that little seed of bhakti, that little seed of devotion, that little seed of love that is sprouting in our heart, the Maha Mantra can actually help bloom. But we cannot expect that by just chanting the Maha Mantra, all my external problems will be solved and the planetary thing will be empowered. Um, it's, a, it's a process, it's not a product. By just chanting a particular mantra, it's not that problems are gone. Recently, a particular lady, she took her initiation, she took uh, vows and she took the Hare Krishna Mahamantra from a guru. She received it and then she wrote me after a few weeks 
She said, Hare Krishna, I wanted to ask you, I took initiation and I have this particular Kala Sarpa Dosha. It's a particular astrological uh, uh, Dosha. Dosha means a uh, negative combination. She said, I don't see any change in my life. I'm still attracting the wrong people. I'm, I'm still, I'm, I still got into a wrong relationship. Why didn't my initiation change it? And then I had to explain that it's the beginning. It's the beginning that you made the vow. You're starting to chant. So what you're doing is going to the root of the problem. You're not just watering different leaves. So all these leaves can be compared to the planets of a little tree, the tree that is our body, our, our identity, our soul. And then each of these leaves can be compared to different aspects of our life. And the seed is that devotion, is that love, is that bhakti, which is in our heart. So if we can empower that devotion, the rest will be taken care. Because if we water the root, what happens? All the leaves also get nourishment. I hope that answer helps. So we have like a couple of minutes. So let us all uh, do just a few breaths. We can close our eyes. Oh, actually, if you close your eyes and you won't know how to do it, <laughs> I'll first show you how to do it. So you breathe, you breathe in and breathe out from one nostril, from your left. So you close one, you close your right nostril, sit straight because whenever you do yoga, whenever you do any meditation, when you sit straight, this you see the Ida and the Pingala and the, you know, the Kundalini, all that energy has to flow. So you sit in a straight position. You close one of the nostrils, and then you breathe in. When you hold that breath, feel that connection with the divine. Be relaxed, don't force it, don't try to hold it too long, as long as it can hold. Then breathe out. And feel that energy in your overall aura. Then you can close your left nostril, breathe through your right nostril, Okay, that's a simple thing. You can practice it later, at least one minute each side to begin with. Then you do breathe in with your left nostril, close it, breathe out with your right nostril. Then breathe in with your right nostril, breathe out with your left nostril. It's called anuloma viloma. I'll type it here. Anuloma Viloma, you can actually Google it. You can get uh, more ideas on how to do it. And then you will have your mind completely under your control. And then you can get your mind to do anything you want. So thank you so much for being here today with me. It was a lot of fun. I hope you had fun too. I hope you'll have fun for the rest of the retreat seminars, sitting at your home and and the comfort of your home and gaining knowledge. Salona, you're, you're, you're muted. <laughs> yeah. um, we have two more questions. I don't know if you have time or are you out of time? I'm okay. I just don't want to go over time. That's all. So I'm okay to continue. Okay. So we have um, a question from uh, Sananda. How to overcome laziness? And is our laziness dependent on some planet? Well, it's not dependent on any planet. It's dependent on you. It's just that the planets are um, a reflection. It's like, if I look into the mirror and it looks weird, it's not the fault of the mirror. <laughs> it's just that I've done something wrong to my face and therefore the mirror is only reflecting. So similarly, we may carry a particular tendency of lethargy that may be reflected through our planets. 
And Sananda, as I know you, you're not a lazy person at all. It's just that you have to find things that you like doing. Then there'll be nothing that can stop you. In fact, Sunday we'll be talking about uh, connecting with your hidden talents, how to discover. Yes, what is. So we will we will discuss more on how to uh, be uh, be how do you say be enthusiastic about things in life. We'll discuss more on that this seminar. But the one line answer is find things that you really like to do. Then laziness will yes, not. Mother. Actually, that was my mother's question, Mataji. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and we have another question. <gasps> what are your thoughts on Kundalini Yoga? Oh. oh. Hmm. See, all these yogic systems, they are serious things. These were practiced by self-controlled yogis, self-realized rishis who were... Um, very elevated in their levels of consciousness and their levels of motivation for why they wanted to do this. And their purpose was to benefit the world through these cities, so through these powers. There are many researches uh, that you can actually, I don't recommend Googling too much because you'll find all kinds of horrific stuff. But there are, there's a place in Germany, for example, they found an asylum and a lot of people there were those people who tried to awaken their kundalini and then that burnt their uh, system, they burnt their uh, chakras in a very, such a bad way that they became psychologically disturbed. So this is to say that any of these practices needs to be done in a proper setting and there is a time and place for practicing certain kinds of yoga, yogic systems and there is a, in the Brahmanda Purana, there is the verse that says in Kali Yuga, Harer Nama, Harer Nama, Harer Nama, Eva Kevalam, Kalau Nastyeva, 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 Gatiranyata. Whenever you know, when you want to emphasize something, you say it repeatedly. So this is three times, three times, three times, this Vedic text is saying, in this age of Kali, Kali means this age of quarrel and hypocrisy, no other yogic system actually gives you the desired result except one process, one process, one process. And what is that? It's to chant the holy names, to chant the holy names and to chant the holy names of the Lord. By doing that, again, you see what happens is that bhakti, that love in the heart sprouts. So you don't have to sit and water every leaf and then burn your whole kundalini system. So I personally, I'm very cautious about these things because these things are misused to a great degree. Even astrology is misused to a great degree. People use it for predictions and people use it for getting what they want. And it's not the purpose. The purpose is self-realization. The purpose is to understand who we are and to surrender to that divine, to surrender to the plan of the universe, to learn our lessons, to grow as individuals, to get along with people that we find it difficult to get along with. So this is my understanding about this. This kind of Siddhi yoga, Kundalini yoga can burn your brain. So watch out. Why don't you have fun chanting the holy names and get the benefit instead of risking your brain and ending up in an asylum? So it's a very tricky thing. Yoga, yoga is supposed to help you develop that bhakti. It's not a separate path. I mean, it's like, right? I'm, I'm going to give a very kind of gross example here, but I think it's, it really fits here because according to the Vedic texts, it is said that... Um, all these other systems, they are dependent on bhakti because bhakti is the heart. It's, it's like imagine you're in a relationship with a, another person of your age and you have their presence, you, you have their bodies with you, they, you have their mind with you, but you, you don't have their heart with you. Like imagine that that person doesn't love you. That person doesn't really, you don't really feel connected with in that soul level, you know, that, that expression soulmate. So you don't really feel that, but you have that person's body. Okay, how much can you enjoy that body? 
how much can you just sit around and watch movies it's not going to give any pleasure right so similarly you can if you take all the yoga sutras and all the yoga system so the heart of it is that devotion to the supreme lord thank him for creating this universe thank him for making us who we are thank him for all the lessons and chant glorify him sing you know eat wonderful healthy food nourish yourself and be grateful for that food so that's the process of bhakti but all these other yoga systems without bhakti is like having the body of the person um but not having the heart of the person even in the best circumstances which is actually not possible in this age of quarrel and hypocrisy so that's actually the truth of the matter so if you want to practice yoga it should be under proper guidance proper yoga teacher who has proper motivation what's their goal what's the purpose why do we want to awaken the kundalini because we want to control uh, everybody yeah somebody oh yeah anna loanna is saying it's called kundalini syndrome yeah that's a kundalini syndrome is a the consequence of people who are trying to awaken the kundalini when they're not ready so it's not for it's not for everyone it's only for the, the yogis who sit in the himalayas for a decade and do meditation and they have no desires left anymore 